In this video, I want to talk about proteins and polypeptides. And we know these proteins and polypeptides are made out of these amino acids. And we know the general structure of an amino acid is we have this alpha carbon, this center carbon. Then on one side, we have a carboxyl group. The other side, we have an amine group. And then we also have an R group. And we know there's also hydrogen. It's not really important. But we know we also have this R group. And depending on what the R group is determines what type of amino acid we have. For example, if our R group looks like this, then we have a serine amino acid. If the R group looks like this, then we have a lysine amino acid. So the R group determines what kind of amino acid we have. So these are just a couple types of amino acids. And notice the diversity in these different R groups. It's these diverse different types of R groups that make protein so versatile. When we create these polypeptides with all these interesting R groups, we can do a lot of interesting biochemistry. So now we have all these amino acids, but we know these amino acids can bond. They can form these peptide bonds. And the simple mechanism, essentially, this nitrogen attacks. When it attacks, it forms a bond. And when it forms that bond, effectively what happens is this bond breaks and the electrons fall on this guy. I'm skipping a couple steps. But the idea is we, we form a bond. We form one of these peptide bonds. And we can do that with all these amino acids. We can form one peptide bond and then another peptide bond, linking all these amino acids together. And if we did that, we'd essentially have this polypeptide. And it's important to realize, once we have all these amino acids covalently linked through these peptide bonds, now we have this primary structure of this polypeptide. And that's the definition of this primary structure of a, of a polypeptide, when it's just this, this basic structure once they're all covalently linked through these peptide bonds. So now we have this polypeptide. But even though we know it's these R groups where all the interesting biochemistry is going on, let's ignore them for a second. So for a second, let's just get rid of all these, these uh, pink R, R groups just for simplicity. So let's get rid of them. So now we just have this, which is referred to as the backbone, the polypeptide backbone, which is made out of these carbons and these nitrogens. So this is the backbone. And again, it was still, it was still the backbone. It's just this part, this blue part is referred to as the polypeptide backbone. So now let's just focus on the backbone. So these backbones can form interesting structures. For example, what can happen is this backbone can start forming a spiral, a helix. So if it formed a helix, it would essentially look like this. So again, it forms this helix, which again, just simply we, it would look something like this. It can also form these other structures where essentially what happens is it bends over. It would bend. The, the rest of this guy down here would bend over. So if we did that, we'd form something like this. Or we could have one polypeptide and then we could have another polypeptide and we could have them arranged next to each other. But why do we form these kinds of structures? Why would we form this, this helix or why would we form this, this bend? What's going on? Well, remember, there's free rotation around all these bonds. Or actually not around this bond because we form that peptide bond, but we have free rotation around this bond and free rotation around this bond. So we have a lot of free rotation. So what can happen is also notice we have this oxygen and we have this hydrogen. So we know this oxygen with its lone pairs of electrons and this hydrogen can form hydrogen bonds. So because we have this free rotation, we know this, this primary structure, this backbone, can form these conformations. It can form a conformation where this hydrogen gets nearby this oxygen, and once they get nearby each other, we form that hydrogen bond. So that's what's going on. That's why we would form this helix. Because again, we have these hydrogen bonds. It's these hydrogen bonds that stabilize. Well, it, it forms that hydrogen bond stabilizing this helix. Then again, we would have this oxygen forming a hydrogen bond with this hydrogen and etc. But again, that's why we would form this helix. This helix is stabilized by these hydrogen bonds. And that also explains why we would form this structure or maybe this structure. For example, maybe this hydrogen with this oxygen could form a hydrogen bond. That's why it would bend. And in fact, it's actually a little more complex how many amino acids are involved in the turn. But the point is we have these hydrogens and the ox these oxygens, which can form these hydrogen bonds, which stabilize these structures. So these structures are referred to as the secondary structures. And there are two types of secondary structures. There are these alpha helixes, and these are these, there are these beta pleated sheets. And again, here's a more uh, in detail explanation of what's going on. But notice we have these hydrogen bonds. You see these hydrogen bonds between the hydrogen and the oxygens, these hydrogens and these oxygens? It's these hydrogen bonds that stabilize these secondary structures. 
But the definition of a secondary structure is one of these structures that are stabilized by these oxygens and hydrogens that are part of the backbone. It's when these oxygens and hydrogens that are part of the backbone form form uh, this structure, that's when we get a secondary structure. And there are these two types. There are these alpha helix discs, and there are these beta pleated sheets. But those are the two types of secondary structures, which are, again, stabilized by the atoms in the backbone. So now let's actually do something very different. Before, we just focused on this blue backbone, but now let's ignore this blue backbone. Because, yeah, the blue backbone is important to form those secondary structures, those alpha helixes and beta pleated sheets, but that's really all. Besides forming those secondary structures, they're, they're not that interesting. So let's ignore them. And instead, let's just focus on these R groups. Because, again, it's these R groups where we have all this versatility. It's where all the interesting biochemistry is going on. So for simplicity, we just, we just drew this line drawing that covalent backbone. But now we have these R groups, and these R groups can also interact with each other. For example, we have this negative charge, uh, this R group, and this positively charged R group. So they can also form interactions. So for example, let's say we have this random, this, this random polypeptide. We know it has all these R groups. So these R groups also want to interact with each other. So for example, we have this negatively charged R group and this positively charged R group, so they're going to want to interact. So that's going to fold and bend this, this polypeptide. These R groups interact bending and, and folding this polypeptide. And we also see we have this region with all these hydrophobic R groups. See all these hydrophobic R groups with a lot of these carbon-carbon bonds? These hydrophobic uh, R groups essentially uh, uh, aggregate due to the hydrophobic effect. So we know due to the hydrophobic effect, they're going to want to aggregate, and that's also going to bend this polypeptide. And it's important to realize internally, once, once this polypeptide folds and forms this structure, internally is where you see all the hydrophobic R groups, because again, they don't want to have interfaces with, with the polar water. But again, it's these hydrophobic R groups that also can bend, forming this hydrophobic pocket, which again also bends the, this, this, this uh, carbon-nitrogen uh, backbone of this polypeptide. And we can also do something else interesting. So remember this R group, because again, remember what originally we had. Remember we had this primary structure with all these amino acids. With all, and something important to realize is these were amino acids, but once we bind them in this polypeptide, now they're referred to as residues. So originally this was a serine amino acid, now it's a serine residue. Originally, this was a lysine amino acid. Now it's a lysine residue. So we also had the cysteine amino acid, which formed the cysteine residue. So we have the cysteine residue. But these cysteine residues are really interesting. So let's, let's imagine we have these two cysteine residues in reducing conditions. When we're in reducing conditions, they, they just, they're not doing anything. They, they have these hydrogens, they're reduced, and they're not doing anything. However... Well, look at them. Look at them. What happens when we create oxidizing conditions? Once we create oxidizing conditions, then they bond. Then they form one of these covalent bonds. And notice, this is the only way we can covalently link this backbone. Now the backbone is covalently linked to these cysteine disulfide bridges. Because even here, we just had a salt bridge, this ionic salt bridge due to these Coulombic interactions. But again, here we actually have a covalent bond linking this 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 peptide backbone. So that's interesting. These, these cysteines and these sulfur uh, residues, these cysteine residues with these, these thiol sulfurs can form these covalent bonds, covalently linking this, this peptide bond. But something important to realize is whenever we have the R groups that are helping fold the protein, we have these R groups helping fold the protein in this very specific conformation. This is referred to as the tertiary conformation. The, the tertiary conformation is, is this conformation due to these R groups. And we have some other interesting R groups. For example, remember this serine residue, this serine residue? It has hydroxyl, and this hydroxyl is very useful. It's very versatile. For example, we can take a hydroxyl and we can add a phosphate. So that's a way, remember, originally we had this, this polypeptide or, or this protein, but now that's a way we can phosphorylate this protein. We phosphorylated this protein. We, we've, we've added this phosphate group to this protein, this polypeptide, and we can only add phosphates to these hydroxyl groups. So now we've phosphorylated this, this, this peptide. But we can do more. We can also maybe sulfate. Maybe we wanted to sulfate this peptide for whatever reason. Or maybe instead of sulfating, maybe we wanted to acetylate. We wanted to acetylate this peptide. So there are a lot of these interesting things we can do to these R groups to, to modify this, this peptide. 
And not just that, whenever we have one of these kind of hydroxyls or, or these kind of amino group uh, functionalities, we can add carbohydrates. We can add carbohydrates. So this is a way we can glycosylate our peptide. We had our peptide, we had our original peptide, but now we glycosylated our peptide. Now we've added these carbohydrates to our peptides. And a lot of peptides and proteins are glycosylated. These can serve lots of different purposes. But again, the big picture idea is once we take all of our amino acids and we link them up, we form this primary structure with this backbone and this primary structure. However, in this blue backbone, we know we have these oxygens and these hydrogens. So they can also form hydrogen bonds, forming these secondary structures, these secondary structures, these alpha helixes and these beta pleated sheets. So when we form a kind of folding or structure due to these, due to the backbone, this blue backbone interactions, that's referred to as a secondary structure. However, when we fold and form interactions due to these R groups, these pink R groups, that forms our tertiary structure. That's the tertiary structure of this peptide. And in fact, we can actually go a step further. Let's say we had this peptide, and let's say we had a second peptide, a completely separate peptide. And let's say they interacted through these, these R groups, through these, these, these same interactions that were used for these for these, uh, for these uh, tertiary structures, but now we have these two separate peptides. We have these two separate peptides interacting. That forms our quaternary structure. So a quaternary structure is defined when we have two individual peptides interacting. So now we form this quaternary structure. But there are these four levels. There are this, this primary structure, these secondary structures, these tertiary structures with these R groups, and this quaternary structure when we have two peptides. And also, it's important to realize it was the hydrogen bonds that stabilized the secondary structures, but we can also have hydrogen bonds stabilizing the tertiary structure, as long as it's hydrogen bonds due to the R groups. Because remember, that's the difference between secondary and tertiary. If it's within this blue backbone, that's secondary. If it's within the R groups, that's tertiary. Or, or yeah, tertiary. So again, now we have our folded protein. Now we form our folded polypeptide. But once we formed our folded polypeptide, how do we denature the peptide? Because now that we form this folded structure, this very specific conformation and structure, now we can denature it. We can denature it, essentially breaking it up, re reforming that primary structure. So how do we denature one of these peptides and proteins? Well, we can change the pH of the solution. For example, let's say we had this peptide folded in a very specific way, and let's say we changed the pH. Let's say we lowered the pH. What happens if we lowered the pH? Eventually, this carboxyl group would get protonated. Eventually, it would get protonated. Now that it's protonated, it's neutral. Now that it's neutral, we can't form these salt bridges. Now we don't form the salt bridge. Now this stops folding. Now, now we don't have the, that interaction. So now this isn't folding anymore. So we can use pH to break these, these, these structures and, and denature this, this peptide. And again, also here, we lower the pH, this, uh, this oxygen gets protonated, now it's neutral, now this bond, we can't form that bond, now we break that bond. So again, we, essentially that's why changing the pH changes the activity of a protein, because it, it affects these bonds, and now it, stop, it, it denatures. And we can, it can also use heat. We can heat up the solution, and what happens if we heat up the solution? We can overcome these bonds. We know there's a bond dissociation energy enthalpy that's needed to break these bonds. So if we add enough heat, we can break these bonds. We can break these bonds and, and eventually we could break these bonds and these hydrogen bonds, etc. And breaking these hydrogen bonds, denaturing this protein. And we can also use reducing conditions. For example, if we had reducing conditions, we know this 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 cysteine bridge would break. These would we remember what happens. This is under oxidizing conditions. But what if we added reducing conditions? If we added reducing conditions, we know it would break. It would break, and then it, it would, we would lose that bond. We would lose that particular bond. But again, and we can also use certain solvents. We can use certain, certain solvents, like hydrophobic solvents, which will also affect these interactions. And also, we can use a solvent maybe like urea. So this is urea. And this urea forms very strong hydrogen bonds. So what happens? We know we had hydrogen bonds stabilizing these interactions, but now what happens when we add urea? Now it forms stronger hydrogen bonds. So now it's going to displace those hydrogen bonds by forming stronger hydrogen bonds. Now this is break. That structure is going to break. So there are a lot of these different ways we can denature this peptide. But again, 
without it, without these and then in the normal conditions we form these kind of structures these these tertiary and quaternary structures which give us the particular conformation to make this protein functional and now i just want to show these are the pro, the 20 proteogenic amino acids so these are the 20 amino acids that our body uses to create proteins. And again, here, here are where all the R groups are, starting all these, these pink dots. So again, see the, all the different types of R groups. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, versatility due to all these different uh, functionalities. And also, this is a picture of a peptide. And I know it looks super complicating. It's like, what's going on? It looks so complex. Well, whenever you see these kind of helixes, this represents that alpha helix. So here we have an alpha helix, and here we have an alpha helix, and here we have an alpha helix. So whenever you see these, those represent those secondary alpha helixes. Whenever you see these thick arrows, these thick arrows represent those secondary beta pleated sheets. So these are both secondary structures. And that, that's what these, these thick arrows and these ribbons mean. This is just that primary structure, that backbone. Then again, we could also have certain tertiary structures with the R groups also interacting to create this 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 particular conformation in 3D conformation but again so that's what a, a peptide is